You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 62. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey there, welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast. I'm Jill Castle, your host, and you've tuned into a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of raising healthy ones inside and out. Today, I am talking about middle school girls and the problem of not eating at school. And I've asked a special guest to come on the show. Katie Hurley, and she is going to help us dig into what is going on with our middle school girls. Sadly, I'm seeing more and more girls who don't want to eat in front of other kids, in front of their friends at school. And I'm hearing comments like, nobody's eating lunch, or I don't want to be the only one eating. Girls talk about what you eat. This food is bad, gross, fattening, toxic. Everybody's watching. It's uncool to eat too much. A quote from an article in Seventeen Magazine said, Lunchtime at school is one of the most stressful times of the day for me. So you can find today's show notes with all the links I mentioned over at jillcastle.com forward slash 062. That's 062 for episode number 62. And if you think it's important to take great care and great tact of your middle school kids, number one, share this episode on your Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages so more parents can find it and listen. Or number two, rate and review the Nourish Child podcast in Apple Podcasts or whatever app you use to listen to the show. This pulls the Nourish Child up in rankings and makes it way easier for other parents, teachers, healthcare providers, and your neighbor to find the show. Now, before I introduce my guest, I want to mention a brand new course that is opening up very soon, in fact, next month, called The ADHD Diet for Kids. You might be familiar with that course because I opened it up in March and ran it as a beta program so that I could polish it up and titrate it into an even better course, which is going to roll out right after school starts in September. The course talks all about nutrition and feeding kids with ADHD. It's divided into three modules plus a troubleshooting module. The modules cover food, they cover feeding. There's lots of PDFs and downloadable uh, sheets to help you feed and grow and nourish the child with ADHD well. So if you want to get on the priority list, go to my website, jillcastle.com forward slash ADHD, and that will take you to a sign up list where you can put your name on the email list so that you get to be the first, one of the first ones to learn when the program is opening up and of course, all the details related to it. I'll be opening this course and coaching program in September, right after the kids get back into school. This episode of the Nourish Child Podcast is brought to you by the Nourish Child Project, a program for parents. Do you feel like you somehow missed out on the basic nutrition education you need to successfully nourish your child? I bet you did. Many parents strive to nourish their child well, but find themselves faced with challenges and questions. In the Nourish Child Project, you will get my blueprint for nourishing healthy kids inside and out. Here's actually what you'll get. A food system that includes a balance of all foods, not a restrictive meal plan or diet. A feeding strategy that is proven to be effective and nurturing to children, as well as ways to build healthy habits for now and into the future. Get the Nourish Child Project today by going to www.jillcastle.com forward slash programs. Okay, today my guest is Katie Hurley. She is a child and adolescent psychotherapist, writer, and speaker in Los Angeles, California. She is the founder of Practical Parenting. Katie earned her BA in psychology and women's studies 
from Boston College and her MSW from the University of Pennsylvania. Katie has extensive experience treating children and adolescents with learning differences, anxiety, and low self-esteem. She is also trained in play therapy. Katie's work can be found in several online publications, including the Washington Post, PBS Parents, U.S. News & World Report, and the Huffington Post. Katie is the author of The Happy Kid Handbook, How to Raise Joyful Children in a Stressful World, and the highly anticipated No More Mean Girls, The Secret to Raising Strong, Confident, and Compassionate Girls. You can see why I asked her to be on the show to talk about middle school girls who are not eating. I think she's going to be a wonderful resource for us and teach us a lot about what is going on when our kids won't eat at school, what is underpinning that issue, and what it can mean for the mental health of our daughters. And then last, what you can do as a parent to really help your child not only eat at school, but feel good about herself. Again, you can find the show notes over at www.jillcastle.com forward slash 062. That's 062 for episode number 62. Hey, Katie, welcome to the Nourish Child podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you here. I know that it's so challenging to wrap our schedules together, but it's fun to have you here because we have two things in common. One, we both write for U.S. News and World Report's Four Parents blog. And two, we have the same literary agent. That's how I first got to know you or knew about you, rather. That's right. And she's such a gem, isn't she? I just love her. I know. She is good. And I haven't had any new books come out since 2015. So we haven't had the back and forth that goes along with that. But you have had a new book come out. (laughs) That's right. Back in January 30th, No More Mean Girls hit the shelves, which was really exciting. Yeah. And I'm excited to sort of wrap that into our conversation today. But before we get going, because we're going to talk about girls not eating in school, mostly middle school girls. And I want to target sort of that age group, but it goes on into the teenage years as well. But before we dig into that, do you mind just giving the audience a little snapshot about yourself? Sure. I'm a child and adolescent psychotherapist, and I specialize in anxiety disorders and stress and actually learning differences. That's where I got my training at a wonderful nonprofit in Los Angeles called The Help Group. It's one of the biggest nonprofits in LA here. And I run groups for girls to just empower them to be their best selves and work together and lift each other up. And I write for, as you said, US News and World Report, but also, you know, PBS and, uh, oh gosh, a number of places. You can find me all over the place these days. Real Simple sometimes runs my articles. So I do a little bit of everything. And I'm the mom of two lovely children. I have an 11-year-old daughter and a nine-year-old son. Oh, wonderful. So for the 11-year-old, this will be a topic that might even be not necessarily personal for you, but you know this age group quite well because you're living with it. (laughs) I sure do. And a lot of my clients happen to be in the probably, I see younger kids too, but right now I'm heavy with nine to 14-year-olds and a lot of girls. So yeah. So what I want to talk about is, you know, something that was, that came up through some of the clients that I take care of. And it's this these middle school girls who are coming home and they go to school, they're playing sports, they have lots of friends, they're, you know, seemingly acclimated, doing great, but they're coming home and they're telling their parents that they're not eating their lunch or they come home saying, you know, nobody's eating lunch at school, so they're not eating very much. And it's causing quite, well, it's causing some physical issues in some of my clients and nutritional issues, but it's also causing a lot of stress for the parents. So I want to kind of get into that, but to give everybody a sort of level playing field, can you tell us a little bit about what is going on with middle school girls in terms of their social and their emotional development? Well, there's just, as you know, there's a ton of change for the middle school age brain. A lot is happening in there and a lot of connections are being strengthened and there's just a lot happening, which is why kids in that age range, they tend to be kind of forgetful. 
<laughs> they tend to sort of walk away from things and not get back to them. You know, these are the kids who leave their homework at home all the time. They're also, you know, they're growing emotionally. So, and they're having all these physical changes as well. So they do sometimes tend to be short tempered or perhaps they, what we view as overreact to minor things. And it's easy for adults to forget that the things we think are small and minor are can actually be quite huge to a middle school child. So, you know, they're dealing with a lot of stuff. They're dealing with shifting friendships. They're dealing with understanding that academics take on a new importance and trying to manage that and trying to figure out where they fit and where they thrive and where they're going to soar and where they need extra help. So, there's kind of there's all these different factors at play for middle schoolers and yes they're growing physically they're getting taller they're getting bigger but their brains are exploding with information and they're really those you know that prefrontal cortex is just starting to really grow and that's the reasoning center you know and so that's really just starting to grow it's not going to be fully grown till about 25 so they're right at the beginning phases of all these important things happening and they're living in a time of excessive pressure on this age group. You know, they're asked to perform in school, they're asked to perform in sports, they're asked to perform in various extracurriculars. There's sort of this sense here in America of everybody's got to be the best at everything. And you have to build your resume starting in sixth, seventh grade. And they feel that, you know, they know it. So there's a lot of different stuff going on in their minds on any given day. Yeah. And would you say that the pressure is at an all time high? I certainly feel like it is. You're on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast. I see it all around me the same. You know, yeah, younger and younger. We're, you know, lining up and applying for preschool, trying to get our, you know, tiny little ones into the best school we possibly can. And middle school, it's just ramping up, trying to get kids in these higher level academic courses. And uh, the pressure just seems like it's so through the roof for so many of these kids. It is. It's it's pretty immense right now. And, you know, one of the great parts of my job is I get to travel the country talking to parents at all different kinds of schools, private schools, public schools, parochial schools, and you name it. And I'm in, you know, some city in some state talking to parents and I am hearing the same thing everywhere I go, no matter if it's a fancy schmancy private school somewhere or, you know, a public school somewhere in the middle of a city parents are feeling under pressure, kids are feeling under pressure, and it's starting younger and younger. And it's, you know, you mentioned the phrase level the playing field at the beginning of this interview. And it stuck in my head because I always just feel like the playing field is never level for kids, no matter where you go. It's just and we try and you know, they try those the powers that be at the top and they say we'll do this and that'll level the playing field. And it's just not. The only thing that's level right now is that everybody's experiencing more stress than they should be. Mm -hmm. And when you say level the playing field for kids, what do you mean by that? And what do you mean by it's not level for kids? Well, you know, what I see coast to coast and in the middle, you know, everywhere I go is just, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't take notice of the fact that some school districts have far more resources than others, that some inner city public schools don't have the same amount of even just pencils and paper and books and teaching materials. So we've got some teachers who are scraping together everything and using half their salaries just to get these kids some bit of knowledge where others, you know, kids are walking around with Chromebooks and iPads in the second grade and are being taught in a much different way. And so, you know, and it's the same with, with sports. We see it in those things too. You have some families who are have kids playing club sports around the clock starting at, you know, say age nine, which for the record, I don't agree with. But, you know, some people can afford to put kids into these expensive, you know, supposedly like really super high athletic programs for their kids to kind of give them a head start in the world of athletics and other people just can't. And then you have other rec programs where kids barely have uniforms and don't have proper cleats for soccer. And so they're not, you know, there are disadvantages all over the place for kids all over America, be it in athletics, in learning, just, you know, getting that head start into the world. And then you pile on all the social emotional stress that just comes with growing up in this sort of bizarre time where we're all racing to the top all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it makes the pressure around eating and food seem sort of trivial when you when you think about 
all the other pressures that kids are under. However, you know, when kids don't eat, <laughs> it's such a stressful thing for their parents. Yeah. Well, also, that's a yet another disadvantage in school, because though they may be making that choice in many cases, although we could argue that, you know, one of the problems with kids under stress and experiencing anxiety is that their appetite does plummet, but then the more their appetite plummets, the less they eat, the worse the cycle becomes. You know, they can't learn as well. They can't play their sports as well. They can't, you know, interact with others as well when they're not eating properly. I mean, proper nutrition is sort of one of those building blocks of our lives, of our everyday lives. So, I mean, maybe it seems trivial in comparison to the bigger issues that we have society, you know, on a societal basis, but I actually don't think it's trivial because I think it impacts their daily interactions and skills and learning, you know, a lot. So that's why it's really important. Yeah, I totally agree. And it is a vicious cycle. So let's talk about middle school girls getting more and more caught up with the pressures around food and eating. And what do you see as the pressures, the pressure to eat, the pressure to not eat, the pressure to be thin or fit or trim, or, you know, the pressure even to pick the right foods to eat. I hear that a lot from my clients, you know, that this is not healthy. This is healthy. And everybody's watching me eat and what I choose to eat. Let's talk about some of those pressures and as, and how you see them playing out in this population. Well, that is kind of the new trend that I'm seeing a lot of is that, and I think, you know, from the goodness of our hearts to some degree, we're really trying to teach kids to make healthy choices, right? So we're trying to instill healthy habits in them. But sometimes things get internalized differently. And sometimes we forget to check ourselves and watch what we're really saying, because I'm seeing a lot of girls in that 11 to 15 range who are just zeroing in on this is healthy. This is not. They're trying to do the whole 30. They're trying to do the bullet diet. I didn't, you know, I didn't even know what that was until an 11 year old explained it to me, you know, and she had learned it from her parents and she wanted to get in on it with her parents. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you're 11. You need to eat like this and this and this. I'd be like going through my, you know, what exactly what nutrients does an 11 year old need on any given day? And is restricting eating really going to be a good (laughs) idea for that child? And so I think part of it is what they learn at home. And part of it is what they feel out in the world. Because, you know, my daughter came home from school and said, Oh, this so and so is doing this whole 30 diet. And should I be doing that? And I'm like, No, you know, no, you shouldn't be doing that. But okay, let's look it up. And let's learn about it so that we know exactly what she's talking about. And no, we're not going to change our eating because you're a great eater. And you're doing great. But you know, so kids are getting all these different messages and then they go to school and they talk and talk and talk and talk. And they, you know, sometimes they misreport things because that's just what kids do. And they start comparing and contrasting and who's doing what and looking at each other. And then, you know, it becomes this cycle. I mean, we've tried so hard to reduce diet culture, especially among kids. But right now, this sort of, I don't know what, I mean, you know better than, than I do because of the nature of your work, but you know, what we would call it, I mean, maybe it's not specifically like strict diets, but this need to always be eating whole foods and healthy foods. And, you know, it's becoming ingrained in their brains and they're comparing to one another and they're stressing out about what they eat in comparison to their friends. And then they're all just not eating and it's really unhealthy. Mm-hmm. I think it sort of ties into this whole perfectionistic society ideal, you know, it's it's the race to the top. And if, you know, eating perfectly is going to get you to the top, it's sort of that same, of the same ilk. But it is disturbing because I think it has an insidious underlying major risk factor that parents might not realize is there. And so we think, you know, okay, this child isn't eating at school and this is worrisome because they might not grow well, they might lose weight unintentionally, but there's more going on, right? There's more of a psychological underpinning that can be sort of harnessed into this whole scenario that can be quite dangerous for girls and even boys. It's true. I mean, and and just, you know, the perfectionism and the rating their own perfectionism based on what they think other kids are doing. It becomes just this dangerous game of always trying to compare and always trying to be a little bit better. And so those things are easily misinterpreted in the tween and teen mind. So if 
better in their minds is, you know, restricting your eating so that you don't quote overeat and only eating these super healthy foods. And then mom throws together a lunch in the lunchbox that has, you know, things that are not perceived as healthy enough, you know, by the group, then the pressure becomes, well, I'm just going to restrict it. And I'm not going to eat any of it because I'm not that hungry. And I don't really need it. And now look at me, I didn't overeat at all. So I won the table today. And I, it just becomes this, it affects their relationships to a huge degree that I think parents are unaware of, because, you know, we can't stop them from comparing themselves to one another while they're sitting around at lunch every single day, because they're going to talk about what they talk about. But what we can do is instill in them a sense of self-confidence at home so that they know that they're making good choices and good, healthy decisions so that they don't have to look to their neighbor to figure out where they stack up because they're really starting to compete with each other. It used to be about sports and, and grades, and now it's everything, right? It's sports, it's grades, it's eating, it's weight, it's you know clothes and appearance. It's all these things are getting tied together and it's really negatively affecting their ability to relate to other kids their own age. So they're, instead of building these deep and meaningful relationships, which is developmentally what they should be doing now at this age range is really digging in deeper and building these meaningful lifelong relationships. They're building these negatively charged interactions with other kids based on who's more perfect and who's reaching a little higher to get to that you know perfectionist medal at the end of the race. Mm. And I imagine there's a lot of stress and anxiety that's going on individually within girls if they're experiencing this at the lunch table. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's hard to be a girl right now. It's hard to be anyone right now. I think we're all just kind of tapped out on stress and anxiety as a whole collective unit. But there just there are a lot of pressures on these tween and teen girls right now. And even if they don't feed into the behavior, even if they do sort of sit there and eat their lunches, I have girls come to me who say, I felt so disgusting. I felt so ashamed. I felt just guilty that I was eating all this stuff and that my friends were only having an apple or a bag of carrots or something like that. So they start to take on all these negative emotions and they internalize those and they begin to feel like they're just not good enough, not good people, you know, and that's a really dangerous message for girls to internalize at that age, because as they grow, their self-esteem just goes lower and lower. And then when they're supposed to be ready to launch out into the world, they're not because they have these negative core beliefs that have developed over time, and they don't feel capable. Mm, yeah. And I know I often talk with my families that, you know, these are the, you know, childhood is the self esteem building years. I mean, obviously, all throughout childhood from, you know, toddlerhood, all the way through teenagerhood, but these child school age and middle school age are so critical, because I feel like, children are really developing their who, you know, like, who am I? They're developing the answer to that question. And they're oftentimes looking to their peers to get the answer to that question. And it's really challenging because you want your child to have that answer internalized already. They, you want your child to know who they are. Right. And it's, you know, it is appropriate for them to be waffling and wondering and, and trying to, you know, figure themselves out and try new things. And that's all developmentally appropriate. You know, where it becomes a problem is when they are trying to morph into their peers or, you know, they're trying to be someone totally opposite themselves so that they please the other people around them because that's not genuine. Mm hmm. How does this tie in to your book, No More Mean Girls? I mean, does this fall in, is this mean girl behavior in the lunchroom? Would you classify it as that or? Well, I mean, I think it depends. You know, there's a range of this behavior, as I'm sure you know. I mean, sometimes there is a pressure to be in a certain group and to be in a certain group, you have to dress a certain way and you have to look a certain way and wear your hair a certain way and probably eat a certain way. You know, I do get, periodically stories from kids, 11, 12, 13 year old kids who have been just, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say bullied, but teased about their food choices, or just comments have been made about their food choices, what those food choices are going to do to them. So there is some of that going on. And, and that you say to yourself, well, okay, so there's a group of girls who's either letting these letting a girl in or not letting her in based on her appearance, you know, and her food choices, well, then yeah, that feeds into 
quote, mean girl behavior. But I think the biggest tie in in terms of my book is is really that chapter on perfectionism and the anxiety that underlies perfectionism and that big pull to not only to fit in and find your people, but to also be the best one and to get everything exactly right, because that's a real burden for girls right now. And, you know, we do see some of these eating issues that can quickly turn into eating disorders, because that's another thing that people don't always realize. I mean, the diagnosis rate of eating disorders doesn't seem that high when you look at a number on a piece of paper. But these kind of restricted eating choices that start out as just here and there can very quickly morph into an eating disorder. And as you know, eating disorders are, you know, they're treatable, but they're difficult to treat. And it, it sometimes takes some drastic measures. Mm -hmm. Let's just circle back to the anxiety piece, just because I have one more question about that. And I'm thinking about my audience who's listening, who might be sitting there thinking, oh, okay, well, my daughter's coming home and she's telling me that she's not eating very much. And I see that she's under a lot of pressure. But from an anxiety piece, what should parents be looking for or how could they recognize anxiety in their child? Well, the difficulty with anxiety in kids and adolescents is that it appears much different than it does in adults. So, you know, adults, you can almost kind of see when you can almost visibly see when people are anxious. With teens and kids, what you're going to see is changes in sleeping patterns is a big one. So usually they'll report having trouble falling asleep at night or They'll be able to fall asleep, but they'll wake up in the middle of the night and just have terrible insomnia and not be able to get back to sleep on a regular basis. So I always say to parents, you have to think about what is your kid's baseline. You know, one bad night of sleep does not equal anxiety, but a pattern of poor sleeping can be a red flag, a big change in eating habits, you know, so a kid who's overeating or just really under eating, and that's very different from their norm, from their baseline is something to watch for, you know, kids who start to sort of isolate and no longer want to do the things that they normally do. And they start to maybe appear kind of agitated. Because a lot of times anxiety in teens comes out as it looks a lot like anger and frustration. So they're kind of biting your head off every time you ask them something, they're snapping at you a lot, you know, more than you would expect, given the circumstances, kids can be very irritable. And they also can, you know, sometimes they will express some of their worries, or they'll start just coming up with because they'll be having intrusive thoughts, which are sort of untrue thoughts playing out in their minds, but or exaggerated thoughts like worries about big things like car accidents and, you know, failing every single test and stuff like that, they may start to express some of those worries and kind of become clingy, you know, you kind of see them almost regressing to appearing like they're at a younger stage than they are. Yeah, it's, um, I work with a lot of extreme picky eaters, and there's always a lot of anxiety around eating and food. And I feel like I can pick it up like, I mean, I'm not diagnosing it, obviously, but right. I mean, when you wor work with enough kids, you see, you can tell who's relaxed and who's not relaxed and who, you know, I, do. I watch yeah, they're kind of high strung. Yeah. You, yeah. You can see that tension, even in their muscles. If you watch them carefully, they, these are the kids that really squeeze their fists tight or, you know, fidget a lot or constantly tap their feet. You know, people always associate that with ADHD, but anxiety kids tend to do those things. They're moving and they're tapping because they're trying to get that tension out of their body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what I also noticed, though, is that, you know, sometimes parents are just really not wanting to hear or address the anxiety. And sometimes it's, it's, you know, manageable, easier when it's a lower grade anxiety than before it gets to be this full blown. And I'm always, you know, asking or suggesting that they seek out a counselor for their child if they are demonstrating, you know, this anxiety that I can clearly see, or at least to go and get, you know, get an opinion about whether it's there or not. Because one of the things that I notice is that it doesn't go away without getting some sort of coping skills on board for these kids. And it builds. I mean, is that something that you would agree with or is absolutely I mean the, I always tell parents I mean and it, it's so hard because there's still such a stigma out there and people will say you know oh I'm totally open to talking about anxiety and depression and all these things and they'll say all those things and they'll say all the words and they'll put the memes on Facebook but when it's their own kid 
it's a different story. And I see this all the time. I mean, people who are super supportive out in public and supportive of other people, the minute it's their kid, there comes that stigma again. It just comes like roaring back because all of a sudden, oh my gosh, it's in my family. This is something I have to deal with. I have to touch it personally. So that's kind of a hard hurdle for parents to get over. But the thing about anxiety is that it is probably one of the most treatable mental health disorders that that we see. And the earlier you catch it, the earlier kids learn to cope and the better off they fare. Now, that's not to say that they can't be treated later on when it's been going on for a while because they can, but it's going to take a lot longer. And, you you know, because the further into their anxiety they get, the more you have to backtrack and help them pull out all the triggers and where did it stem from and when did it start and when do you last remember not feeling this way? And, you know, you have to kind of go back to square one. But if you, if somebody says a teacher or, you know, nutritionist or whoever, or doctor says, you know, geez, she's needing, it looks like she's really struggling here and, and is presenting with some symptoms of anxiety. Let's get an evaluation from a therapist. Jump on that because once they have those tools and they have those coping skills internalized within them, they can use them and they won't need the therapy forever. But, you know, if you wait, it's kind of a dangerous game. Like if if you keep waiting, wait and see, wait and see, wait and see, it can really become so intense that, you know, I see kids who refuse to go to school and not, you know, you people always think of that as like an early school thing, like preschool or kindergarten or first grade. I have 14 year olds who just can't get themselves to school every day because they're too anxious and it's too hard and it's too overwhelming. So that's what happens when we don't treat it. But when you treat it early, they become successful. Mm -hmm. So in terms of parents who are out there listening and wanting to help their children, particularly if they have a middle school daughter who is showing signs of anxiety or even just you know, talking about how nobody at school is eating and the parent is suspecting that their daughter's not eating, what should they do? Are there steps that they can take? Are there, is, a, is there a best practice in terms of addressing this issue? Well, I always say that particularly in this age group, knowledge is power. And, you know, you see it with other things too, like, you know, vaping is a big thing in middle schools right now. I can always tell the kids who have not just been lectured or told don't do that, but have actually been taught about what vaping can actually do to you and what might be the results of putting that into your body, you know, every single day or even just once, because they're the ones who look at me and go, oh, no, that's like, I don't want to do that to myself. I'm not interested. And then versus the other kids who haven't been educated, they haven't learned, they haven't watched the YouTube videos or looked up the information or read a book about it because they'll just kind of smirk and say like, oh, my mom says not to do it. So with eating, it's the same thing with eating and proper nutrition and growing brains and growing bodies, you know, get books out of the library, look things up online from reputable sources, you know, skip the, the sort of, you know, instant MD kind of sites and, and get on the Mayo Clinic, you know, or Johns Hopkins has lots of great information about a wide variety of developmental topics. Harvard, you know, go to reputable sources and find information about what, you know, Boston Children's Hospital is probably another one that might have some resources that just it will teach them, well, what do they actually need? What is happening to their brains right now at age 11 or 12? And what do they need to feed that? How do you proper, How do you make sure that your brain has proper nutrition? One thing I see all the time is kids who drink very, very little water. And it's not because they're drinking tons of juice, because a lot of parents have gotten the message, don't drink juice all day long. They're just not drinking anything. And so that plays into anxiety because their brains are not properly hydrated. So I have these, I'm educating kids about what your brain needs to feel calm during the day. So go out there and get the information with your child, you know, learn, talk about it, and then empower them. Say, you know, all right, I get it. It's really hard at the lunch table because kids aren't necessarily like, eating different stuff, like let's, let's figure out what you need. And let's get you involved, you know, get kids involved in cooking their own foods, you know, so they don't want to eat meat this month, fine, figure out an alternative, teach them how to do it, learn with them so that they have the protein they need, and they have the vegetables they need, and they have the, you know, carbs they need for a little bit of energy and all the different things that they need. 
empower them to take control of that because when they're in the driver's seat, they're more likely to make those healthy choices. Mm -hmm, Definitely. And for raising a girl who will actually eat, (laughs) what tips do you Mm -hmm. have for parents? Well, I mean, you know, it's kind of the age old, you got to model it. I mean, I can't pretend to be the most adventurous eater. And my husband was terrible as a kid. I I don't think he ate cheese until he was like 11 because he had to, because he was at a friend's house and grilled cheese was on the menu. So he was just like a picky eater because he was picky. I wouldn't say that I was ever a picky eater, but not super adventurous. But we have taken to like, you know, our daughter, we just take her all over the place. You know, you want to go to little Tokyo and try food there? Great. Let's do it. Like we just go on eating adventures. We actually, one of the great things about, you know, I'm not a huge fan of tons of screen time, but one of the great things about living right now is that you can watch all these cool cooking shows and cooking competitions, and you can learn about all these different kinds of food and styles of food. And that inspires kids to, you know what, I want to do this. I want to enjoy food. I want to be someone who eats. So just, you know, really it's modeling it and, you know, talking about it openly and honestly, like not lecturing and saying, and, you know, not punishing, oh, you didn't eat. So now you can't do this. Or you didn't eat. So I'm taking away your phone. Those things really don't work. It's the same as like sticker charts for toddlers. They don't work. You know, they make, they make teens mad for like a minute, but, and then they may start lying to you and pretending to eat and throwing the stuff in the trash so that you don't see it. And you don't want that. You don't want secrets and lies and you don't want bad choices. So you got to talk openly and honestly and empathize and say, you know what? I get it. I remember being 13. I remember once feeling like I was the only one eating the French fries at the table and I kind of felt embarrassed and I didn't want to feel embarrassed because I wanted the French fries, but I did feel embarrassed because none of the other girls were eating them and I didn't know what to do. So have those hard conversations and have them more than once. We do this thing where we have one conversation about one difficult topic and we think the problem is solved. What we know about tweens and teens is they need daily interaction on this stuff. It These are things that are a constant stressor for them, or if not a stressor, just a thing, you know, something that's sort of buzzing in the background. This is the white noise of tweens and teens. So address it, you know, bring it to the surface, have conversations about it. Don't consequence because of it. Ask how you can help. You know, if, if it means growing your own garden so that you can grow your own salad so she packs her own salad to bring to school for lunch, great, do it. You know, grow a salad in your backyard. I mean, figure out creative ways to get kids interested in food. But there are, you know, like I say, there are so many great cooking shows for, te- you know, that involve teens, you know, Chopped Junior. And um, there's, a, there's a bunch of them now that have kids in them and teens in them. And that's a great place to start because it's kind of like watching American Idol and then you want to be a singer. Well, watch these great cooking shows and you're going to want to be a chef. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. Yeah. It's not easy for parents to raise kids and to feed them these days. And it's, they can use all the help that they can get, honestly. And these are the sorts of things when their kids aren't eating or they're struggling in school socially, emotionally. It really puts stressors on the parents and on the whole family. And having tips like this can really help keep things in perspective. So thank you for those. So where can my listeners find you and tell us how they can find, I know you have two books out. Tell us a little bit about that too. I have two, that's right. I have two books out. Um, The Happy Kid Handbook is all about childhood stress and anxiety. And No More Mean Girls is my more recent book. And that's despite the title, it does it does address relational aggression and some of the bullying that occurs between girls up front in the first chapter. But it's really about empowering girls to kind of work together and to get through some of this stuff together. It has lots of information about self-esteem, perfectionism, being socially responsible, you know, all sorts of different things. So it's got lots of, it's very prescriptive. So there's lots of specific tips parents can use for different topics. It's not a book you have to read, you know, first chapter to last. You can kind of skip around and say, oh, I, I, this is, we need assertiveness skills. And there'll be some very specific, you know, games and strategies you can use to work on assertiveness skills or a variety of other topics. So those are available everywhere books are sold. I I sure do love if you go to your local independent bookstore because we love our indie bookstores at Penguin. But you can find me at practicalkatie.com is my website where I house a lot of information about my speaking and books and writing and things. And you know, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the rest. 
Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Katie, so much for coming on the show. And I know that there will be people tracking you down. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, I'm back and I hope you enjoyed Katie's interview. I found it very enlightening and it really helps me think through some of the clients that I'm managing on my end who are sitting across from me in appointments and telling me that they just aren't eating at school because everybody's staring at them or nobody eats or I'm hearing that they're not having an after school snack right before they go off to some big, you know, two hour sports practice. All of this eating behavior or these eating habits are coming from a place of peer pressure and high expectations for perfectionism around eating. And as you heard Katie describe, this can really cause a lot of anxiety and stress and pressure in our girls and in our boys too, if they're experiencing that. But also that it can really be the underpinnings of disordered eating and can quickly lead to an eating disorder. So I hope that you listened to her advice about role modeling and what you can do as a parent to expose and teach your child about these things that they are telling you. And I would add, you know, perk up your ears and be very aware and tuned in to what your kids are saying and watch them. Watch for those signs of anxiety because anxiety does affect a child's eating and it can be that circuitous or circular feedback loop where uh, they're not eating and that's causing more anxiety, which is causing less eating, which is causing more anxiety. And it just gets to be this cycle that is very difficult to break. Thank you again for listening today. I'm Jill Castle, and the purpose of this podcast is to help you nourish your child inside and out. The show notes are over at jillcastle.com forward slash 062. I'd love it if you came over to my Facebook page, The Nourished Child, and joined me, or subscribe to my Monday morning newsletter, and even more importantly, subscribe to this show so you can get a notification every time I release a new one. And as you know, or as I have mentioned, subscribing to the show really, really, really helps other parents and professionals discover it and learn something new about nutrition to help them feed and nourish their child better. You're sort of just passing on good information about nutrition for kids. Don't forget to check out Katie's books and her website. The links will be in the show notes. And again, thanks for joining me today. I'm so very glad to connect with you. Please be sure to give the child in your life a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.